नमस्कार प्रसन्ना जी वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन थैंक यू आपने समय निकाला तो वट वुड बी दी अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी और रेकोलेक्शन दैट यू हैव ऑफ इधर दी आइडिया और द एक्सपीरियंस ऑफ अहिंसा वेल माई पेरेंट्स probably are the inspiration for me they first of all are vaishnavites but more than that they have been uh, from a very very lower middle class family we were four children they took care of us in the way only a sustainable lifestyle can so we've always been very very uh, you know concerned about these things you asked me about uh, ahimsa it's a bit of a difficult uh, thing to answer because uh, i have always been a very angry person i have been uh, um, you know going out of my way to uh, tell people the truth and i have always often ended up with uh, fights so if you ask me whether i am a very ahimsatmak person i was not and even now i don't claim to be very very ahimsatmak uh, in a sense uh, for example my parents called me prasanna you know the this uh, very pleasant uh, person i wasn't really a very pleasant person mm. i had my uh, problems and uh, i was not even very settled you know in terms of uh, various things uh it's really the village that actually uh made me settle down calm down slow down a bit mm. and uh, it's it's a very interesting thing that happened in the village mm. when i went to the village from, is this is this hegadu yeah. that you are talking about yes 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 i went to hegadu about 38 years back uh before that also i used to visit hegadu as a theater person but about 37 38 years back i decided to shift to a village and what happened was uh when i went to the village i wanted to do something and there was resist a natural resist any village will offer to you when you go in but uh, i didn't understand that i started becoming angry i started uh, fighting with them and all that but slowly i realized that you can't fight with somebody who you have to meet the next day in a village there is no such thing as uh, a bombay life in bombay you fight with somebody you don't have to see that person's face the next day or any day mm-hmm. but in a village you have to live with people you have to negotiate with people and this thing of trying to negotiate with people it came to me dawned on me slowly and that's when i decided to use uh, ahimsatmak method uh, in order to build charkha this women's cooperative that uh, you know i started in uh, hegod so initially it was just a um, strategy mm. but then that strategy actually helped me realize what it is and maybe i'm slightly better off now than i was before mm. these days i've started smiling with people these days i've even started giving a little time to the other person to speak out you know one of the biggest uh, accusation my one of my wives i have i had two wives and both of them left me <clears throat> was that i don't listen to her she used to get so angry look why don't you listen to what i want to say i couldn't of course i was right in the sense that i knew what she was saying but the point was as a human being she wanted me to listen to her and i couldn't listen to her now i have started listening to people so you could say that my my um, attempt at understanding the other trying to negotiate with the other is the essential ahimsatmak quality for me what brought about this transformation inside you i'm very curious can you trace 
is there a sequence of happenings or effort that you made or experiences that you had uh, because i think many people will be keen to know how one can make this transition uh, look i have uh, in my own small way i have always been successful in the sense when i dropped out of chemistry which I was at iit of, right uh, you I, dropped out of iit yes I was a very successful uh, person in uh, science. I went into the best IIT at that time, Kanpur IIT, especially for chemistry. Uh -huh. it, it had C N R Rao. We had it had Professor Mutan. I mean, the best people were there. I dropped out and joined the National School of Drama. Now, at the National School of Drama, also I was quite successful. But then, my uh, sense of discipline, my sense of system. my sense of perfection yes perfection actually made me a very irritable person and as a theatre director you need to shout because you are outside of uh, that that whole world you know which you are trying to direct there are those actors who are trying to build a relationship amongst themselves and you are standing at a distance 30 feet 40 feet 50 feet away and you have to tell them so you have to raise your voice but then this thing of raising one's voice to tell people gets into you as a habit your voice changes you are uh, you are face starts becoming angry and people are scared of you all theater directors go through this problem people are scared of you actors are uh, scared of telling what they want from you so even though i was successful i was terribly unsuccessful uh, in terms of human resources you know i didn't realize it for a very long time people would say ab to bahut acche director hai bahut acche natak karte hai aur sahi dhang se karte hai aap alkazi sahab ke student hai alkazi sahab ke jo bhi discipline hai wo aap mein aa gaya hai aap bahut systematic hai par bas beyond that they would not come closer to you so it was a serious problem for me and as i said earlier it is only the village which finally made me realize what it is yeah yeah was it something about the pace of village life you think that may have hel helped you to make the transition because uh, in the urban context life is always so fast it's Uh, frenetic there's a kind of very high nervous energy so could that be a factor absolutely i was uh, a city person even now i am a city person in a very fundamental sense after living in the village for about four decades i have not become a villager i am an urban person but i would say that i have learned a few good things about the village life one of them is to slow down one of them is to actually let things happen to you rather than you always desperately trying to make things happen you know there's a great deal of difference between the two when you are relaxed and when you have a vision actually things start happening yeah. the old people the traditional people would call it uh, providence you huh? know भगवान के इच्छा से तुम्हें अच्छा हो रहा है एक्सेट्रा एक्सेट्रा मे बी दैट्स आल्सो ट्रू बट इट्स आल्सो दैट व्हेन यू स्लो डाउन एंड व्हेन यू आर रिलैक्स एक्चुअली यू आर एबल टू रेस्पॉन्ड टू हुएवर कम्स टू यू एंड ट्रांसमिट दोस आइडियाज द ड्रीम्स और व्हाट एवर एंड थिंग्स हैपन करेक्ट दिस इज अ फंडामेंटल या या um to prasanna ji if we shift now uh, to the larger scale which is i think in your case both through your engagement with theater and as a social and political activist um, how do you see the role or the place of ahimsa today in life in india because we are living in a time when uh there's a great deal of uh, communication in social media and other channels which tends to suggest that non violence is for weak people 
and that non violence is uh, what enslaved india so i would like to uh, hear your thoughts on uh, you know your response to these uh, allegations and uh, do you think it is misinformation what is being spread well uh, it is a misinformation but it's a very very well documented uh, argument because this argument begins at the very beginning of the 20th century and it begins between gandhi ji and uh, savarkar uh, it is not proven whether actually savarkar was present in those conversations in england when gandhi ji had gone there for some work and ended up uh, staying in england for about 3 4 months because the work got delayed and he was meeting constantly meeting this so called revolutionaries amongst the patriots uh, indian patriots the young people and there whether the savarkar was physically present or not i think he was but uh, i i have not read uh, about that the point was gandhi ji was saying that look ahimsa is not just non violence meaning ahimsa is not just absence of violence he was talking of it in a much broader sense while uh for savarkar whether it was non violence or violence was both very very political for example savarkar makes no bones about it when he says that buddhism actually was a deterrent to indians because he says it is buddhism which made made us cowards it is buddhism which taught us this uh, ahimsa and that's why we became enslaved and all that so as you very rightly put it these two views are very very opposite of each other and this uh, what i would call the savarkarite view entered into india very very late now i am always very intrigued by savarkar because if you take savarkar the early savarkar if you for example read his book on 1857 it's an amazing work and whatever he did during those times so amazing and then two aspects of savarkar and gandhi starts coming to the fore gandhi was a true believer i don't think there was any ram bhakt bigger than gandhi at that time he truly believed and he truly even experimented with belief when he boldly went and tried to study christianity islam and all that and finally he said no i don't need to uh, shift my religion he said my religion has all the good things but it also has some bad things so he decided to uh, work it out while savarkar oh, did not believe he was uh, you know uh, he was non conformist he did not believe in god initially at least i don't know what happened later and then as a non believer he tries to build a philosophy for hinduism or a strategy for hinduism so which leads to this thing that uh, you know it all becomes ideological we we suffered uh, under the hands of so many intruders why because we were cowards he doesn't understand for example that every religion why hindu religion every religion begins with love every religion it is not just uh, buddhism it is not just christianity it is not just islam even every indian religion begins with love every saint you know especially the shudra saints you see they had to be non violent because they had to work and worship you see they were not fighters they were not soldiers kabir had to weave meaning had to weave the fabric and also weave the truth so for him weaving was a double activity and the moment you break this uh, amazing uh, tana bana of uh, weaving and weaving truth he felt or he he said it that the whole thing breaks and that's the end of the world today what we are seeing is 
that complete break between truth saying and working. The working person has become an achut, while the truth saying person has become uh, upper caste, rich, and uh, arrogant. You see, arrogance comes into you when you suddenly think that you are the negotiator for the ultimate truth. Whereas for Kabir, this could not have happened because the poor fellow had to also negotiate with the weaving. And I don't have to tell you, Rajniji, you know weaving. It's such a complex and such a skill-based uh, thing that even if you falter for a second, your satya will go, your weaving will also go to dogs. Yeah. So, I am very, very, these days, fascinated by the Shudra saints. Hmm. I know the upper caste saints also did an amazing thing. But for them, the only way to get out of this gamand, you know, this arrogance, was by, become, was by begging. Now, why did all the upper caste saints and religious leaders begged? Big because job, they realized, you know, the truth, the arrogance of truth had to be gotten away so that they went to real truth, which was a humble uh, thing. Whereas for a Shudra, the Shudra was actually trying to reach towards the truth. He had the great skill in his hands. Whether it was Ravidas or whether it was Kabir or whether it was Baswanda or uh, even Akka. Yeah. So this is something which uh, is actually helping me understand this notion of Ahimsa. Wonderful. Wonderful. So you've been talking about the saints and currently you are doing a very major national campaign which is called, uh, which is named after a very famous line from Kabir. Kabir ji, Dhai Akhar Prem Ka. So, I think if you could first uh, explain to our listeners, uh, what is this poetry of Dhai Akhar Prem? Because many people outside the Kabir tradition and outside that language tradition don't automatically understand what is Dhai Akhar Prem. Well, just this line means that love after all is just two and a half letters. Meaning, in a sense, love is as simple as that, just two and a half letters. While anything else will need maybe 10 letters or 15 letters or 100 letters. Some things need million, millions of letters and even then you will not uh, explain it. Um, but when you look at the whole or when you listen to the entire uh, Doha, you see, it is talking about the Pandit and the Ghamand of the Pandit. And it is suggesting that the ghamand of the Pandit is, is not allowing the Pandit to understand this very, very simple thing called love. And in a sense, all of us, I won't say just the BJP or the RSS, but all of us, you, me, the left, the great intellectuals, the great English-speaking people, all the urban people, our problem is that we are all in the same way. We think that everything has been known. It has been known, but it is okay. You know, it has been known We have understood it theoretically. But have we experienced the truth? You know, when you, when you talk of Kabir and when you talk of the weaving of his, are the Ravidas's, uh, you know, cobbling of uh, it. You see, there is an experience because you are using your own hand, your own eyes, your own uh, lips in order to do this. There is no question of uh, Ghaman coming into it. So Kabir's Doha is a very profound uh, thing which we need to take seriously. These days, I'm very angry with my uh, you know, writer friends, because writer friends can sit in their rooms and uh, write poetry, prose, philosophy, anything. A theater person, luckily, is slightly better than them because I have to use my own body. 
my actors have to use their own body my actors i say that they are the cousins of the craft people and very distant cousins of the intellectual people yeah. the writer types so so you see now do you understand why suddenly theater acting has become so central young people in in thousands are coming into the sector never before in india had it happened dalits women dropouts from very very cushy jobs upper caste upper class foreign educated all of them are quitting all that and desperately seeking acting i see it is not because they want to become stars maybe that also is there because everybody wants to get recognition get some money and get some better life but the point is they are coming into theater where they realize that they can through theater come to their sense you see because after all the whole world has become intellectualized all of us all politician all bureaucrats all writers all of us are all here in our heads we have such great ideas everybody has great ideas you know it's not just communists it's not just congress it's not just bjp everybody has great ideas they are all talking of the good things all the shri shris and uh, all the modern day saints they say amazingly interesting things but none of it has sense because they don't feel it they don't experience it in order to experience it you have to actually go meet the people and have the patience to listen to them their language is different they would not be talking so fluently as yes. you and me do and this jatha that ipta is doing is precisely just that this jatha is going to people not to tell them but to listen to them or get my sense back through this chat that's the idea of the sipta jatha ye yeah, how did this idea of the yatra come to you and what is the full name of the yatra and what is its plan uh firstly this is not the first uh, yatra that i have been doing personally let me begin with a personal story uh this is probably the sixth yatra that i have uh, undertaken in the last uh, 10 years maybe um it all began with uh, handloom actually you see when i started uh, working with charkha uh slowly one got into advocacy you had to deal with governments you had to deal with policy and as a result uh, you started uh, banging your head uh, so to say with them and when the banging of the head did not uh, work out you would take a jatha uh with the you know viewers uh, with you and so it uh, happened like this and this uh, every time i have gone through this uh, padyatra or jatha i have realized that i am more benefited than the others or the cause to which i have done the padyatra i felt wonderful about it. just the fact that you can walk uh you know 10 15 20 kilometers a day in amongst the nature amongst the birds it actually slows you down it feel makes you feel uh, happier and better um so finally what happened two years back ipta people asked me to become their national president i initially refused i said look i have the experience of working with left cultural organizations uh, yeah because i have i was the one who built samudaya for the cpm at that time and i did not break my links with them but i walked uh, quietly away because i realized that slowly it was becoming more of a party cultural rather than a cultural organization uh, which would uh, help them understand things like that so i told them no i am not interested 
but then they said no sir we are actually trying to make ipta go back to its best days which was in the 40s when ipta was initially started when everybody who mattered in culture and in art joined hands to fight uh, colonialism and also fight for example the great bengal famine and uh, you see it had people like uh, ravi shankar saifi azmi and uh, actors like uh, balraj sani even devanand even uh, you know i mean you can just go on talking the names tailendra yeah so when they said this then i started having a conversation with them i said do you understand the difference between then and now in terms of what has happened to it uh, in terms of what has happened to this country and all that so that eventually resulted in a fruitful uh, conclusion and i became the national president of it last year on their own they had done a small jatha on uh, dhaya karpre they had done it in about five northern north indian states i like the idea because they did not use too much of angry sloganeering or too much of uh, ideological bhashan baji but instead they went to places of uh, you know for example where premchand was born or some saint kabir was born or, or uh, rahul sankrata and ke ghar gaye mai bhi gaya tha wahan teen din and they took a handful of mitti from there collected it and at the end of the jatha that mean that uh, they are now trying to make it into a small uh, center so this year i told them that look i think this should be extended to the whole country let's have a, a padyatra all over uh, india and then uh, things started uh, you know questions started coming up how do we do that i said let us first of all not have physical continuity because the moment there is a physical continuity in the jatha it will become one one india one language one this and all so let's break the physical continuity but keep the time continuity so we have deliberately made this jatha uh, you know hop around the first jatha which has just now finished uh, was in rajasthan five days and after that it had to go to kerala kerala was go, you know postponed a little because of uh, nipa virus uh, problem and all that and now since yesterday it's happening in bihar after bihar it will go to punjab like that it will go all over the country in each state or in each cultural zone as i would like to call it the jatha happens for about 6 uh, days or 7 days or at the most 8 days where we will be traveling for about 100 kilometers on foot it's not a big affair in the sense of uh, thousands of people joining the jatha like it happens when a a uh, great uh, religious figure uh, does the jatha or when uh, rahul gandhi does it or something it's a small one where we go and talk to people understand uh, that world and send it across to the rest of the country through the social media through our writings and through our pictures and all that so that's what uh, we are trying to do uh, then the other thing you know what you have uh, raise the issue of non violence it is such an amazing thing that in the jatha the experience that we are having is telling us that we can actually be non violent and still talk to the people and change the people for example in rajasthan i was there we were going in the jatha suddenly there was a lot of shouting and screaming i turned back and saw this drunkard who was shouting something incoherent i just went and hugged him and said kya problem hai aap tumhara unhone kaha ki ji aap to jatha mein ja rahe hain aur gana ga rahe hain mera to mujhe mera ye nahi mila hai mera provisions nahi mila hai you know the rations nahi mila hai so i just laughed and said भैया मैं तो राजस्थान का चीफ मिनिस्टर नहीं हूँ मैं भी तुम्हारे जैसे आदमी हूँ मैं जा रहा हूँ तुम जी चलो मेरे साथ सो ही स्टार्टेड वॉकिंग विथ एस ही इज अ वाल्मीकि ही वॉज अ पुलिसमैन एंड 
then he started reciting from sayings believe me he knew every doha of every kabir and every ravidas and everybody and it was on his lips it started coming out like a pouring rain we sat in a tea stall and it was an amazing spectacle i said oh my god this man is more learned than me or anybody from the city you see unfortunately we have decided that the village people are idiots the village people only know how to dig earth or to do agriculture no they have a value system they have a philosophy and they have uh, their own moral uh, things even today it exists in spite of all the havocs that we have done to that it still exists and that is the gold mine we are trying to dig and then the question comes of how are we handling today's monster the monster economy and the monster uh, hatred it's not just in india but it has spread to the whole uh, world to humanity humanity is not threatened by one party or the other but it is threatened by extinction an extinction uh, pushed by monster economy which is causing uh, climate uh, change which is causing uh, great wars it is causing so many things on uh, on one front and then this mistrust this anger this frustration now suddenly i realized this drunken valmiki has an answer to it so when you know the jatha is actually made me aware that oh my god they have always had the solution and we have always been the problem we have been the problem here i want to tell you i rather i want to come back to where you started you know the savarkar gandhi debate and the distinction between uh, ahimsa and uh, non violence or or violence you know what we are talking about is the ideology of ahimsa or the ideology of intolerance let me confess in front of you that a lot of rss activists are probably in an actual sense more tolerant than me that's how they have succeeded they go to people they talk to people and then they take them to the uh, to their rss uh, shakhas they have succeeded in doing that they have converted the whole india into rss shakhas so i should first of all confess that they have been more successful in being tolerant on a day to day level then what is the problem the problem means they after all that tolerance after all that love and affection they teach you the ideology of intolerance see there is an ideological problem there savarkar's problem is savarkar is a great patriot yes but unfortunately he decided or he thinks that the only way to solve this problem or the only way to protect the hindu is by eliminating the others or by converting or then forcing them to live like in the hindutva mode now this is intolerant have i made uh, myself clear yes 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 please continue because i think that's a very powerful point you're making yeah yeah please continue how are oh, you so yeah. yeah sorry sorry yeah no no yeah, how I, i you know it would be great now if you can connect this observation this insight with the experiences you're having now on the ground see first of all all of us who are trying to handle the intolerance in courts should realize the problem of intolerance is machine made how you see the machine makes the economy a monster it is the machine which makes the society into a monster it, it is the machine which makes a political party into a huge party and factory into a huge uh, this thing where human being humanity human considerations 
become less and less and less important. So actually what we are going through is a machine versus man conflict. Now this conflict, Gandhiji handled it in one way, the RSS is handling it in another way. Gandhiji handled it exactly like Kabir wanted to handle it a few centuries back. In that sense, in that sense, I would say that the Gamcha, which we have taken it as a symbol, was handed down to Gandhiji by Kabir, Kabir <laughs> Das. I, or I, I accept that. Ke se humne usko liya nahi. Gandhiji ke haath mein hi chhod diya. Aur usko khadi kapda bana ke politicians usko pehna aur thoda karab bhi ho gaye. Kaar mein ghumne lage. To logon ko khadi ke baare mein jo aasa tha, wo ghat gaya. Isi liye humne gamcha chuna hai. Gamcha bhi khadi hai, par gamcha working people they use it to wipe their sweat. Yeah. So, Gamcha is very important for me. And now look at the RSS. They are also very seriously, honestly trying to handle this problem of the monster. But unke problem kya hai? They don't want this combination. This combination of the Satya and uh, Shrama. Shrama alag karte hai, wo satya ko alag karte hai. Wo machine ko laate hai. Narendra Modi ji, you see, he, he is as eager as the communist China in making us the biggest economic power. And he will stop nowhere, he will stop nothing in order to make us the most powerful machine-made country in the world. The current times are seeing a great deal of alienation and anguish that is a consequence of this machine culture. But intolerance and, uh, you know, violent behavior towards those who one set of people thinks are others, are there, are not them. That is not new. That is there in other periods of history also. So how do you see that context? You see, it was always there. This intolerance was always there. You know, uh, religious clashes have always happened. Wars have always happened. People have lost their wives. Women have lost their uh, children, whatever. But it was all much smaller than this because those societies, those communities were much smaller. Today, it's a monster community and when anger hits you or intolerance hits you, it is a monster intolerance. You know, Rakshas Panto itana bada bad jata hai, usko aap samal nahi sakenge. That is what bothers me. Yeah. See, I, you know, let me go back to this Gamcha. Hmm. Now, Gamcha is a metaphor. Hai. पर गमछा रियल भी है अब इस रियल गमछे को देखो यू नो इंडिया फॉर एग्जांपल प्रोड्यूस दिस कॉटन हैंडमेड कॉटन फैब्रिक फॉर द होल वर्ल्ड एंड इफ वी डज इट फॉर एग्जांपल आई वुड लाइक टू टेल नरेंद्र मोदी जी दैट दिस कैन बिकम द इंडस्ट्री ऑफ द फ्यूचर आई वुड से इंडस्ट्री ऑफ द फ्यूचर बिकॉज this industry will then be the most carbon neutral industry in the world. Hamare paas hai the most carbon neutral industry in the world. Aap G20 ke president the, Vishwu ke pure log, nayak log, you know, the leaders came and they were suggesting ki aap bade bade wahan mein Electrical battery laga ke ye mitigation ki je ka, ka, climate change ka ya to uh, bade bade <coughs> you know this uh, windmills dal ke ki je wo bhi hai but can you imagine this silly gamcha can mitigate it better than all those uh, transporting things and all that we should have told the world that let us take this because after all after food 
the biggest need of the humanity is clothing. We should concentrate on production of food with the least amount of energy being consumed, which is possible. Of course, possible. I don't talk about it because I'm not a specialist on agriculture. People have yeah. written books and books about it. But I want to talk about the next largest sector, which is clothing. Absolutely. India can be the leader of this uh, sector. We can build an industry which can challenge China, which can challenge Vietnam, which can challenge America and everyone. And it can mitigate uh, climate change in an amazing way. So... In the process of uh, taking out this yatra, you are, and in any case, otherwise also, you interact with so many young people. How uh, do you address their doubts about Ahimsa? Because I meet a lot of young people who uh, are drawn to the idea, who are drawn to the ideal, but they feel it's very daunting in today's world to try to walk the path of Ahimsa. So how do you guide them? You know, it's like the swimmer who is uh, looking at the cold water in the lake and refusing to jump. But if you jump, it will take you just 30 seconds for you to adjust. And then the uh, happiness that you feel in uh, swimming and the energy that you get and all that, that's the difference. Anyway, uh, Ipta has uh, decided to let the youth lead. There's a lot of uh, work happening in order to let them lead. For example, we have formed a, uh, what we call a control room uh, for uh, you know the social media thing and various uh, communication problems because this is happening in 35 states. This uh, thing is entirely led by young people and they're doing a brilliant job, you know. Things are coming, you know, material is coming and material is going to so many places. They sort it out. And from now on, there is also going to be, uh, you know, anybody who wants to join the Jata anywhere can actually register and join the Jata for two days or three days. All this is going to be done. And uh, so on the one hand, we are trying to make this Jata a very, very systematic uh, canvas campaign. On the other hand, we are trying to make this jatha the most natural thing where we are not expounding any ideological views, but we are going to the people because we do realize already the first five days in Rajasthan has made us realize that the solution lies with them and not with us. You know, ecology, for example, in Rajasthan, very close to Alwar is this place, the Darga of a Muslim saint who is revered by both Hindus and Muslims, this man who was uh, a nai, you know, hair cutter by caste, he uh, started tending uh, sheep and uh, cows. Today, about uh, 100 square miles of the Aravali hills is protected by him protected in the best way, in the most scientific way. Water is flowing in those hills for all the 12 months, even during the thick of the, uh, you know, famine. There are animals, there are trees. It is, a, it is amazing to watch that place. So actually, you know, when, when BJP talks of this great Indian tradition, they're right, but they're also wrong. They talk of it as if it is one. They don't want to think of the variety and this amazing thing. The Muslims are not enemies. There may be clashes. You know, every community, Buddhists have clashed with, uh, clashed with Hindus. Hindus have clashed with Jains. I mean, it happens. But then we don't make it a big thing. Manipur, for instance. The clash between, or the tension between Metis and Cookies, it is not today. It is. It has remained there for a Thing, but everybody has tried to mitigate it and you know and, and negotiate a, you know unfortunately today that has not happened. I don't want to blame any one party or anything. They are all responsible. But they are more responsible because they are in power. 
You see, BJP is responsible, much more responsible than me. They should not be arresting uh, journalists for saying something. For heaven's sake, I have the right to talk about Indipur. And suppose you think that what I say is not 100% correct. Can you just arrest me? Are you arresting the tension? We are all concerned. We are all trying to say that, look, this is not the way, but you are arrest the tension in a different way. Instead of arresting the tension, you are arresting people. Yeah. But how do you so, respond to this? How should we respond to this non-violently? You know, we began with this uh, discussion. Non-violence is something philosophical. All religion begins non-violently and then becomes violent. The moment it becomes a, you know, a structure, a very rigid structure, religion becomes the most intolerant thing. There are more wars that religion has uh, spewed than any other uh, arrogant king. Christianity, for example, you know, this uh, Cuban leader, Fidel Castro, was asked by somebody that, uh, you know, what is your idea of Christianity? Without blinking his eyes, he says, if you're talking about Christianity for the first hundred years, I'm a Christian. But if you're talking about the Christianity of the later period, where Christianity piggyback raided with uh, the Roman Empire, when they were trying to spread themselves into the whole world, he says, I am not with that. So even religion, we should understand it more dynamically and not so formally. Thank you. And any closing thoughts? Uh, nothing. The closing thought is that we as a humanity are facing the biggest threat ever. I'm not even sure whether we'll be coming out of it uh, positively. But I'm very happy and I'm enjoying every bit of this effort to save humanity from this complete collapse, whether it is the environmental collapse or the internal moral collapse. Let's keep on trying and leave it to God or uh, Providence for the rest to take over. You know, I, this is what I want to tell the young people. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much and all the very best.